In this episode of Microcast, I want to demonstrate one way you could implement remote control of your hardware project with minimal time and code. If you've been paying attention to hardware lately, people have really lost their crap over being able to control hardware from their smart device. It seems like if you can demo turning something on remotely with your iPhone, then there's a VC somewhere ready to give you money, or at least a lot of gullible Kickstarter backers. So my purpose today is to quickly show you how you can accomplish this and hopefully get you on your way to remote controlling your project. So what are we trying to accomplish? Let's see, we have our Raspberry Pi and it's got some things attached to it. Sensors, LEDs, lights, things like that. We wanna control all of this stuff from our smartphone, but how? We'll obviously wanna use the end all be all solution for hosted software, the cloud. And to get our devices to talk to each other via the cloud, we'll use WebSockets. This will allow us to send messages from our smart device to our hardware. So to make this all work, we'll use Node.js for our server, socket.io to implement our web sockets, the RPI GPIO package to control our hardware, and finally Heroku for hosting the whole thing. We'll start with the web server, which will serve as the broker between our Raspberry Pi and client device. So let's go ahead and make a directory here. We'll call it magic, because that's really what this is to most people. For this project, we'll be using the Express framework. It's a super fast way to create a website. All we have to do is type in Express server, and that'll go ahead and create everything that we need for a basic website. We'll just CD into that directory, and then all we have to do is run npm install. This will install all the dependencies of our Express website. Once that's finished, we're ready to start editing our site. To do that, we'll go ahead and open up Sublime Text and drag our folder over. I'll go into the Server folder, and then into Views. And from here, I'm gonna create a new file. I have some basic HTML that I pre-wrote to save us some time. So I'll go ahead and copy all of that and then we'll paste it in. We'll save this as index.html. As you can see, this is pretty simple. It's just 53 lines of code and basically has a fancy checkbox. And to get that fanciness, we'll use some predefined CSS that I pulled off the internet. I've included some links in the show notes. So we'll go ahead and replace everything in style.css and save that. Let's go ahead and close these windows here. And then we'll come into index.jade and just say include index.html, which will cause that index HTML page to be served up when we go to the root of our website. All right, so let's give this a try. All we have to do to run this is node bin slash www. We can come over here to our web browser and we'll just do localhost port 3000. That's the default for Express. And there we have it. Just a simple page that has a checkbox with some fancy styling. Awesome. Now that we have that going, let's start working on our web sockets. If we come over here to socket.io, let's start with the server. As you can see here, we can run npm install socket.io to get it. But because we're gonna host this later, let's use the package.json approach. So we'll come back over to Sublime Text and come into package.json and we'll add a line for socket.io. We'll just use star for the version, which will just pull the latest. After we've done that, we just need to come back to our command line here and run npm install. That'll install everything for socket.io. Once that's installed, we just need to write a little bit of code to add it to our Express website. So we'll come in here to the www file and you'll see how simple this is. All we have to do is var io equals require socket.io to bring in that package. And then we'll just do a dot listen and pass it the server that we just created above with the Express framework. That's all there is to it. Then we just do an io.on connection, and this will fire whenever a client device connects to our web server. We'll just do a simple callback that takes a socket as a parameter. And for now, we'll just do a console.log client connected. All right, great. Now the next part of this is the client piece. So if we come back to the page here, all we have to do is grab this script, we'll copy it, 
and we'll bring it back over here to our HTML page and we'll just put it right at the end before the closing body tag. You'll notice I've also included jQuery here. We'll use that in a minute. So let's go ahead and add a new script tag. And the client is just as easy as the server piece. All we have to do here is do a var socket equals io.connect and then pass it a URL. In our case, we'll just pass it the root of our website. Next thing we'll do is we'll just add a little bit of jQuery code here to select our checkbox and put a handler on the change event. So anytime the state changed, we'll call this function. And all we'll do here is just say socket.emit and then we'll give it a name of a message. Let's do state changed. And then we'll pass along data with that, the state of the checkbox. All right, that's it. Now, if we come back over here to our server, we need to do something with that message. So all we have to say is socket.onStateChange. You remember, that's what we called it. And then we have a callback function, and that'll pass the state that we sent from the client. Now in here, just for now, let's do a console.log state changed, and we'll display the state that was sent by the client. All right, that should do it. Let's see if this works. We'll go ahead and run our server again. Then we'll come back here and we'll refresh our page. And you'll notice right there, client connected. Awesome, that means our client's connecting to our server code. Now, if we change the state here, you'll see that those events are registering back on our server. Perfect. Now that we have the server side piece taken care of, let's work on our client that's going to run on our Raspberry Pi. So bring in another window here and we'll go ahead and we'll CD back up into the magic directory and then we'll make a new directory called client. And we'll CD into that. What I'll do is I'll just do a touch app.js so that'll show up in my sublime uh, viewer here. And we'll come in here and we'll start editing this file. Now we're going to say var socket equals require. Now instead of requiring socket.io, we're going to want to require just a little bit of a different library. And that's called the socket.io slash client library. And the argument that we pass to that is the URL that we want to connect to. In this case, it's just going to be localhost port 3000. All right, that's our socket variable. Now we just do something very similar that we did on the server. We'll do socket.on connect, and that'll happen when the connection is made to the server. And then there's a callback function. And for now, we'll just do a console.log connected to server, just like that. Okay, let's save that. And what we'll do is we'll start our server back up here. And then we will start our app. You can see the client connected from, that's the browser one. And we'll start node.app, okay. And I forgot you have to install the Socket.io client, so let's go ahead and take care of that. All right, now that that's finished, we can just do node app.js. Okay, you can see we got it connected to server and we got a client connected. Excellent. Okay, so all the plumbing's in place here. We've got our client connecting to our server and our browser connecting to our server. So let's come back over here. And let's add a little bit more code. Let's do io.emit. So when this gets a state changed event, what we want to do is emit an update state event to all of the clients that are listening. And we'll pass the state along to those clients. And then on our client here, we just need to do something with that message. So we'll do a socket.on. And, and whenever we get that message, that update state message, we'll call this function 
that has the state passed to it. And for now, again, we'll still just do a console.log. The new state is, and we'll print out the state. Okay, so sh this should be the full communication cycle between our UI going up to the server and then our server communicating back down to our client device. Let's see if this is all working. Start our server back up here. Start our client. All right, perfect, look at that. We're getting the states pushed down to our client. Excellent. Okay, let's go ahead and close these. Now that we have the communication up and working, let's fill in the details of actually controlling some hardware. For this screencast, I'm just going to demo turning an LED on and off, but it's really a trivial extension to attach a light, a toaster, or any other device, including sensors, that could communicate in almost real time back to the server. Since I'm just using an LED, I need a way to access and toggle one of the GPIO pins. For that, I'll be using the rpi-gpio node package. A big shout out to James Barwell for putting this together. Watch how easy this is to set up. We just come back into our client application here. We're going to do var gpio equals require, and then just re require that rpi-gpio package. Now something I like to do when I'm working with this module is to make sure things get cleaned up when the program exits. And to do that, we'll just do a process.on sigint. That's what gets fired when the program exits. And we'll just put a call back here. And what we'll want to do is just gpio.write. We're going to use pin 12. That's what my LED is attached to. And true. Uh, setting the pin high turns my LED off. So I want to turn it off because when you call this destroy method here, it doesn't reset the pin. So the LED would stay on if I had left it in an on state. So we'll go ahead and do gpio.destroy after that. And once that's finished in the callback, we'll just call process.exit. Then all we have to do is gpio.setup on pin 12. We'll set it as an output. And then we'll do a callback. Right when it sets up, it defaults to false, which will turn my LED on. And I like it to be off by default. So right as it's set up, we'll do a gpio.write and set it to true. Just put a comment here. Okay, that's all it takes to set up the pin. And then now when we get that update state message, all we need to do is do a gpio.write. And then we'll want to do the opposite of the state just because of how I have my LED hooked up. And that's really all there is to it. Our hardware is ready to go. But so far we haven't really fulfilled our goal of controlling our hardware from anywhere. We've just been messing around with localhost, running everything from my machine. Do you remember those old Microsoft commercials? To the cloud. To do that, we're going to use Heroku. If you've never heard of Heroku, I highly recommend checking it out. It's like an Amazon AWS or Windows Azure that uses Git workflow for deployment. It's probably the simplest way to push a website onto the internet, and they have a free tier for you to play around with. Since it uses Git for deployment, let's set up our repository. First thing we want to do is create a git ignore file because we don't want to store all the node modules in our repository. So we'll just come in here and in our git ignore we'll just do node underscore modules. Save that. Now what we have to do is a git init. And if we do a status here, you can see it picks up all the files that we want to track. So we'll do a git add dot to add all of those, and then we'll commit it with a commit dash M, just initial commits, fine. Okay, perfect. To make working with Heroku even more easy, they've created the Heroku tool belt. I've already installed that, and we'll put a link to it in the show notes. Basically, all we have to do here is Heroku login and then provide our credentials. And once that's done, all we have to do is Heroku create. And this is gonna create a site for us on the Heroku backend. You can see there murmuring hamlet-774. And it adds the Git remotes for us. 
So now all we have to do is a git push Heroku master. And while that's updating and loading, let's go ahead and modify our client. We're no longer wanna we're no longer going to want to connect to local host. We're going to want to connect to that uh, murmuring hamlet-7744 just out on the regular internet. We'll go ahead and save that. Okay, everything is loaded up on Heroku and we are ready to see uh got a misspelling here. Take that R out. Okay. Now, if we can come out here, we can actually test this. Just put the uh, URL here into the browser. And we should see our control. Let's see what happens. All right, we are live on the internet. So I went ahead and copied the client code over to my Raspberry Pi, SSH'd into it, copied that over, and I installed the Socket.io client and the RPI dash. GPIO modules. I didn't feel like you needed to watch that. So those are all installed now on my Raspberry Pi. So let's run this and see how it works. So we get the connected server. And when we toggle this, we get the messages that the state is changing, but the LED is not doing anything. It's important to remember that when you run this, you have to run it as sudo. Otherwise, it won't be able to access the low level things that it needs to, to be able to turn the LED off and on and off. So we try this again. Now you can see when we turn it on, awesome. We get the LED going on, we turn off, works like a charm. And you can see like we turn on there, there was a little bit of delay. Let's turn it off. And there's a little bit of delay there. Not much, pretty close to real time here. Now that to me is pretty amazing. We wrote very little code. In a very short time, we were able to get our Raspberry Pi hardware set up for remote control via web interface. The sky is the limit at this point. You could have your client emit sensor readings to the server for real-time graphing, or have the server emit different messages that cause various things to happen on the Raspberry Pi. What we've done is set up the basic plumbing, but you can certainly see the potential. Now I do want to be clear that this is a very basic implementation of remote control and does not take into consideration things like security and error handling, but I hope it gives you some ideas of how you can take your projects to the next level. As always, if you have any questions, I'm here to help and would love to hear from you. See you next time and happy hacking.